Welcome to the introductory series of videos on how to create a sediment transport file in HEC RAS. This is the second video on how to generate sediment transport boundary conditions and the sed file. Um, my name is Stanford Gibson. I am the sediment transport specialist at HEC in charge of the sediment capabilities in RAS. And in this video, I'll walk you through how to create a sediment file for a 1D HEC RAS model. If you haven't done the first part and created a quasi and steady flow file you can do this standalone if you already know how to do that we provide those files or you can just build on to the quasi and steady flow file you created in part one so a sediment transport model in RAS needs two basic types of data you need bed data and boundary data the bed data the sediment that goes in the bed those are your initial conditions what is the control volume and gradation of the sediment that are in your bed at time zero. And then the flux data is the boundary conditions at, at every kind of upstream external node. And so you need to specify not only the sediment mass that comes in at those boundaries or concentration, but also the gradation of that material, which can be a challenging part. The files we've provided under Sediment Demo 2, we have solution files in case you want to go in and see what it looks like when it's all done. But the data files have a project file, a geometry file, and then just the quasi and steady flow file that we developed in the last video. And then we have sediment data. And so we're just going to go and press the open or the file open and say sediment demo to data files and select the project. And so you see we have a project file, a geometry file, and a quasi and steady flow file. So next we have to enter sediment data. To enter sediment data, you go to the menu Edit Sediment, or you press the Sediment Data button. Now the Sediment Data Editor can look a little intimidating when you first open it up, because it has all these blanks that you may not know how to fill in. But we're going to fill these in pretty quickly and zero in just on the actual data we need. And so there are three tabs here, Initial Conditions and Transport Parameters, boundary conditions, and then this optional BSTEM tab that's really only if you're going to do bank filling analysis, which will get its own separate video. Really what we're going to focus on is the initial conditions, which is really the bed gradation and the bed control volume and the equations, and then the boundary conditions, which is really about the flux at the upstream boundaries or any lateral fluxes that you want to add. So let's start with the initial conditions and transport parameters. You have to define bed sediment for every cross section. And if you come over here, you can see the profile plot or the individual cross section. And so each cross section needs a sediment reservoir or a sediment thickness below the bed. And so the way that we're going to do that is you can either put in a maximum depth, which will be how deep the sediment goes below the, the thaw wag, or a minimum elevation. A minimum elevation is much less common. That's if you say know the bedrock elevation and want to define that kind of distinctly in the real world. But generally, we just put in a max depth, um, particularly if it's an alluvial channel that can erode without much constraint vertically. So we're in SI. So let's just start out with a 5 meter maximum depth. And that means that we'll allow all of these cross sections to erode 5 meters. We can update that to make it a bigger sediment reservoir if we need it. And then the other question is, what are the extents that we're going to allow to erode? And so this you can go in and define more carefully later, but this button right here, Use Bank Extents, allows you to define your movable bed limits as your banks. And so now, if you come in here, you'll see this cross section has a sediment control volume or a sediment reservoir associated with it, full of erodible sediment. And so the next thing we need to do is define the gradation associated with that sediment. Now, this again looks pretty intimidating because every cross section needs a bed gradation. There's no way around that. We need bed gradation information for every cross section. And you almost never have bed gradation at every cross section, but we have a couple of options that allow you to interpolate or to associate a bed gradation with multiple cross sections. So if you come in here to the sediment data, you're gonna open the tutorial data and this is the flow data we used in the last one. If you come down here to the next tab, bed sediment, we've just defined a single bed gradation. Bed gradations are usually defined in the 
geotechnical cumulative distribution function. And so this is a size and percent finer curve. What you're going to do first is you're going to enter all of the bed gradations you have into this generalized bed gradation database here in RAS, where it says define and edit bed gradations. You'll put all of your bed gradations in here. In this case, we only have one. So we press that button, and then whenever you see this new sheet of paper in RAS, that's, that's where you create something new. So we're going to create a new bed gradation, and we're going to call it sample one. And then I'll just come over here and copy all of these. And you're going to copy starting at the top to make sure they go in the right place. And then paste them here. And you can see we're using percent finer. You can put in the grain class percentage as a discrete percentage of each grain class. And you can see we'll let you convert between them as well. But we're going to use the percent finer nomenclature because it's a little bit more common. And a lot of times, these are the data you get back from the geotechnical lab, except sometimes they're not in this log base 2 scale, where every grain class is twice the size of the one below it. And so in that case, you have to set it to fit, or you can go in and define your own grain classes. All right, so I'm going to say OK. And so now I have a bed gradation. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to associate that bed gradation with the cross sections. If you click over here in the bed gradation field, now you get a drop down menu. And in that drop down menu, it will be all of the bed gradations that you have defined. So you can come here and say, I'm going to choose that sample there. And you can choose another sample downstream. And then you can press the interpolate button to interpolate between them. Or you can choose the sample, hover over the, the lower right hand corner to get the crosshairs, click and drag, and associate the same sample with multiple cross sections. Now I'm going to come in here and save the data. I haven't saved this yet, so it's going to prompt me for a name. And I'll call it sediment data. And we're on our way. So you can see that even though the sediment data editor comes up with a lot of blanks and there might be some cognitive resistance to that, we can fill them up pretty quickly and then go back and work on them as we develop the model. Really, there's only a couple other things you have to do here. And these are some of the biggest decisions you're going to make. You have to decide on your transport function, which is the equation that you're going to use to kind of turn your hydrodynamics into sediment transport potential or capacity. And you have to choose your sorting and armoring method, which is the bed mixing method that determines whether or not you're going to develop an active layer that will reduce your erosion. We'll have to deal with these in a different venue um, or a different video because these are relatively complex ideas. But for now, we're going to select the Larson Copeland transport function and the Copeland or Exner 7 mixing method. Why am I choosing those? Well, because I know that they're going to work on the system um, a priori. And let me just say again in this video that this system does not exist in the world. It's completely contrived um, and should not be used for research or planning purposes. Now, all of my initial conditions and my equations have been selected. What we need to do now is define our sediment boundary conditions. And that's how is our sediment going to change in time? We basically need a sediment flux and a gradation of that flux for every time step. But we almost never have time series of sediment data the way we have time series of flow data. So there are multiple ways to do this. If we go to boundary conditions, you'll notice that we require a boundary condition at the upstream boundary of our model. And if we go and open the geometry file, you'll notice that it's a, this is a single reach. And so we only have one upstream node. So RAS only populates one required boundary condition. So you'll notice there are three possible upstream boundary conditions. You can define a sediment load series, which is just a time series of sediment data that you can put in manually or bring in from a DSS file. This again is pretty rare, but sometimes you know, the USGS will develop a sediment time series for your gauge based on sediment data or rating curve. Or sometimes you've got a sediment washoff model like SWAT or HMS, and you can de develop a DSS time series and bring that in. The other option is equilibrium load. Um, this is a pretty popular option and is frankly way more popular than it should be. Um, it's very easy because you don't have to input data and it just computes the equilibrium flux at the upstream end. 
But if you're doing a sediment model, it is unlikely that your system is in equilibrium and this can introduce a lot of data. The most common, more credible method is to define a sediment rating curve at the upstream boundary condition that will look at the incoming flows and compute a sediment load for that upstream boundary condition. Now I'm going to do an entire video just on developing a sediment rating curve. There's some statistical nuance to this, but let's just say that we've got one now and we're just gonna talk about how to put it into your model. So we're gonna select rating curve. And what you'll see is we get a rating curve with actually a lot of rows in it. It seems like there's more rows than there should be. Well here, we're gonna put in our flows and here we're gonna put in our sediment loads. But then that will give us our mass flux. And you'll notice down here, you can do this either in load or concentration, but that'll give us our sediment flux. Usually it's a power law. Generally, this is some sort of power function. You know, the, the relationship between load and flow is usually, you know, load is flow to some power, usually around two or between 1.5 and 2.5. But then you're going to have to break that flux down into the different grain classes, which is where this gets particularly challenging. Now you can define any number of sets here um, and you would want to define you know, more than two sets if you have a flow load relationship that isn't linear in log space. Let's say that it's supply limited. So at the higher flows, you get less load or maybe vice versa or if the gradations don't change linearly. Um, and so we're going to open the sediment flux boundary condition. And here we've actually defined four flow load gradations. And so I've actually included the power function here I used to generate my flow load curve. And so this is the flow low re load relationship in these top two rows. But then our sediment flux has to be broken down into the individual grain classes. So for each of these flow load pairs, the loads are then broken down into the percentage or fraction of each grain class. Now you can type these in as percentages or you can put them in as decimals. Um, it, it doesn't matter to RAS. RAS is gonna add them up and then divide in order to get an actual true ratio. They could actually just be masses. But you can see that here we have basically 40% very fine sand for the smallest flow load pair. And then we have 65% very fine sand for the largest flow load pair. And so a valid question might be, where will you come up with these data? Well, sometimes there are load gradation measurements associated with gauges or studies. And so you can look at how sediment changes with flow. Um, does it get coarser? Does it get finer? Um, which would you expect? Would you expect sediment in general to get coarser or finer with flow? It's actually a pretty interesting and complicated question. It turns out that it could do both. In some cases, as flow increases, the, the sediment load gets finer. In other cases, as flow increases, the sediment load gets coarser. Um, I've included a link on a paper we've written on this topic that actually will talk, walk you through the different mechanisms that could cause the two. But in this case, we've got something that works for the system. And so we'll just copy this and then paste it. And you'll notice that I, I actually went in and I selected all the cells that I wanted to paste into before I paste because RAS doesn't always work like Excel where it will automatically populate everything out. You actually have to sometimes select the cells before you paste into them. And then you can plot your rating curve. And because we just use a power function here, it's linear in log space, which of course means that the higher flows have disproportionately higher load, which is the way that rivers work. All right, we say, okay. We go to file, save. And now you'll notice we have a sediment data file here and our sediment data are complete. And in the next video, we will run this and then look at some output and then think a little bit about what those output mean. And we we'll just have a couple of comments about some of the things that go wrong and some of the things that you can do to improve your sediment transport modeling. At this point, I'd like to recognize that these videos have been supported by the Flood and Coastal Storm Damage Reduction Research and Development Work Unit of the Corps of Engineers and that a lot of the sediment transport features in HEC RAS were based on the sediment transport features in a previous program called HEC6, which was developed by Tony Thomas 
And much of the technology that we built this program on is based on his decades of work and insight. All right, we'll see you in the next video.